Hey everybody, this video is called Anointed as King, and tonight we're continuing our pass-through study here in the book of 1 Samuel, where we're looking at Saul being anointed as king by Samuel. So, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? So we know from where we left off last week in this book that the Lord had chosen Saul to be the leader of Israel and God communicated his choice through the private anointing of Samuel and signified a setting aside for God's service. And the inheritance was God's nation Israel in the sense that she uniquely belong to him as we looked at back in Deuteronomy 4 verse 20 about half a year ago. And uh, I want to, I normally wait for the New Testament uh, passages toward the end, but I really want to read this verse here. And did you know that in Christ we are all God's anointed? Anointed. And in 1 John chapter 2, In verse 20, it says here, But you have an anointing that comes from the Holy One, and you know all things. So, sometimes today you're going to hear the word anointed or anointing being used in a charismatic way. Some people see, you know, pastors are more anointed than others. But we are all anointed in Christ, if we are in Christ. And in the New Testament, anointing is to be filled with and blessed by the Holy Spirit. And in verse 2, back in 1 Samuel 10, it says, When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zauzah. And they will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has seized Karen about the donkeys and is worrying about you saying what shall i do about my son so zelza is not a name that you hear of in the bible it's only mentioned here which means our rama and that was located between bethel and bethlehem where rachel died back in genesis 39 verse 15 and samuel gives saul a pacific prophetic word by which saul could have confidence that this anointing was really from God. And if the men at Rachel's tomb didn't tell Saul where to find the donkeys, it would show Samuel as a false prophet. In verse 3 and 4 says, Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. So Tabor wasn't far distant, Mount Tabor, but an unknown location, probably near Bethel. And Samuel's prophecy could be verified as true or false, unlike some of the the vague modern day prophecies that people practice today. And it would generally be unusual for men to give a stranger like Saul a loaf of bread. In verse 5 through 7, after that you have come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you come here to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place in a string instrument a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into a great man. And let it be, when these signs come to you, that you do the occasion God demands, for God is with you. So the Philistine garrison was most likely Geba, and Benjamin, and it was approximately 
five miles north of Jerusalem. And here, prophesying was about praising God. And the Holy Spirit would enable Saul to declare the word of the Lord with the prophets. And with this empowerment by the Holy Spirit, Saul would emerge another man equipped in the manner of Gideon. And Zephthah for the deeds of valor. And the three signs that are mentioned here in verses 2 through 6, Saul was to do what must be done. And Saul was to do what his hand was found to do. And we'll see more about the group of prophets when we go through the book of 2 Kings. And in verse 8 says, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and to make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you must do. So Gilgal, as we're going to see in the next chapter tomorrow, is where Saul would eventually be declared king by Samuel and offer sacrifice before the Lord without the prophet Samuel in chapter 13, verse 12. And Gilgal was east of Jericho, but west of the Jordan River. And seven days was the appointed time Saul was to wait for Samuel to come and tell him what to do, as chapter 13, verse 8 speaks of. In verse 9 through 13, it says, So it was, when he turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the, up to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he was indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to a high place. So we see that God prepares Saul for kingship by having the Holy Spirit come upon him. And Saul was an unspiritual man who became very spiritual at the time of when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And Saul prophesied without ever being recognized as a prophet. And a proverb is a common occurrence or a saying, in case you were wondering. And verse uh, 14 through 16 says, Then Saul's uncle said to him, his servant, Where did you go? So he said, To look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, please, what Saul said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. So I wonder if Saul's uncle was shocked to see Saul with very oily hair. And the information that Samuel gave Saul about becoming king, he didn't even tell his uncle. And this showed that Saul, at this point in time, has a sense of humility. In verse 17 through 19 says, Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have brought up out, uh, Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversaries in your tribulations, and you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. So the Lord's choice of Saul, we see, is made public at Mizpah, and it was the place of spiritual revival before Israel's victory over the Philistines back in chapter 7, verses 3 through 8, or 5 through 8, sorry. And despite the past faithfulness of God to his people, we see that they still desired a human king over God as their 
king. And they wanted this human king to deliver them from their enemies' hands. And God reminds them of his faithfulness back in the Exodus. In verse 20, 21 says, And when Saul had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matre was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So Saul was probably selected by the casting of lots. And it showed that God chose Saul, not just any man. And the choosing by lot simply confirmed the word of the Lord through Samuel. And in Proverbs 16, verse 33, it says that we may cast lots, but it's the Lord who determines how they fall. In verse 22 through 24 says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is none like him among all the people? So the people shouted and said, Long live the king! Long live the king! So overwhelmed, Saul had hidden himself in the military supplies. And Saul's physical stature was impressive with his head and shoulders being above rest. Gave Saul his kingly presence. And verse 25 through 27 says, Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up, laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So Samuel goes on to remind the people of the regulations that govern the conduct of of kings according to Deuteronomy 17 verse 14 through 20 which we were back in March and valiant men who were eager to affirm God's choice for Saul and in response to divine impulse joined him and in verse 27 I love the word rebels I, I don't know I've always liked the word rebel maybe it's because that's what people called me growing up but rebels mean son of Belial and they did not recognize Saul with the respect befitting a king. And whatever book that Samuel wrote of in here wasn't willed by God to be preserved in his eternal uh, will. His eternal word. Because we see that there's this book. He wrote this in this book. And we don't know what book this is exactly. But... To wrap up, we see that Samuel anoints Saul. And we see that Samuel tells Saul of a sign to confirm the anointing as king. And we must know that when the word is from God, it is always fulfilled as God says. But not always exactly as we expect. And we saw that Samuel tells Saul of another sign to confirm on what God has done. And if you believe prophecy is still manifested today, we see that in 2 Thessalonians, that we are called, or 1 Thessalonians it might be, we are called to test it. You know, I'm not going to get into the whole cessation versus continualism debate, but if you strongly believe that God is still prophesying through people today, you better test what you hear. And if it goes against God's word, it's not true prophecy. And most of the garbage that you hear today is all about God's happy with the world and all that stuff. And, you know, God's word tells us otherwise. These are false prophets. And it's not garbage like, thus says the Lord. There is someone in here with a headache in front of 
thousands of people. We, we see those types of services on TV where they try to paint it off as America Crusade, but they, they throw out a random thing that most likely one person out of a thousand is going to be experiencing, you know, such as there's somebody in here with a headache who has pain and you can be healed right now. And that is very vague and broad. And we saw that Samuel tells Saul a third sign to confirm what God has done. And we see that Saul was to be waited for at Gilgal by Saul. Or Samuel was to be waited for at Gilgal by Saul. And we saw the signs come to pass. And Saul hid his experience from his family. And we see that Samuel's speech to the nation before the appointment of the king and we see that Saul was selected by lot and revealed as king and this is where we see the monarchy being established and that's gonna wrap up this video for today we'll see you next as we're looking at Saul's victory at Jabash Gilead and we are officially one-third approximately one-third of the way through this study of 1st Samuel so I hope you have a great rest of your night God bless